rules for June 21st, 2022. It is 5.30. Tonight, our invocation will be read by Member Almond. Thank you, Madam Chair. Train your mind to see the good in everything. Positivity is a choice, and the happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. Please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Member Allman. Please let the record reflect that school board members, Member Allman, Member Krause, Member Pinnock are present in person. Member Calderon is via online, and Member uh, Sanchez had a family emergency, so she is not present. Um, roll call agenda for to <clears throat> excuse me for tonight is Member Kraus, Member Allman, Member Calderon, and then myself. Um, also in attendance is Board Clerk, Superintendent, and Board Attorney. Uh, board Clerk, do we have any acknowledgments? And Superintendent, do we have any ag agenda modifications? Yes, Chairman. The addendum for good cause is marked on our electronic agenda by a green flag named addendum item. Okay. Okay, agenda modifications, school board members. Member Kraus? No modifications, Chair. Member Almond? No modifications, Madam Chair. Member Calderon? No modifications, ma'am. And I have no modifications as well. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda outline? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, any discussion? Any opposition? Member carries. We have presentations tonight. Yes, we'll start with our veteran of the month, Mr. McKenzie. Board member, superintendent, it is my pleasure to present to you today the veteran of the month, Buck Sergeant Bruce Law. Bruce enlisted in the United States Air Force on December 11, 1981, at the age of 17. Bruce went to basic training at Lockland Air Force Base in Texas from December 1981 until January 1982. From there, he received an assignment to attend technical training at Chonti Air Force Base in Illinois from January 1982 to May 1982 to complete another phase of his technical training. Bruce's first base he was stationed at was Medall Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida as a um, basic vehicle equipment mechanic for a two-year stint. He then shipped out to Ellendorf Air Force Base in Alaska to complete his final three years of service. Throughout his service in the United States Air Force, Bruce received numerous awards and medals, including Air Force Overseas Long Tour Ribbon, Air Force Good Conduct Medal, Air Force Longevity Service Ribbon, and Small Arms Expert Marksmanship Ribbon. Bruce was honorably discharged from his service on December 10th, 1986, wanting to continue his Air Force training and selfless service to our community, he became a vehicle mechanic with Seminole County Public Schools in September of 1990. Mr. Law was hired by transportation director at the time, Mr. Jerry Klein. You served as a bus inspector ensuring that every bus in Seminole County met federal and state requirements for safety um, and um, with over 20,000 students riding a Seminole County bus each year of over 30 years of employment, he had the direct hand in meeting the mission statement of Seminole County Transportation and providing safe, effective, and efficient means of transportation for over 600,000 students for our district. Bruce has been married to his wife, Angela, which is also a bus driver for over six years. Um, also, he has two da daughters, Alexandra, Jennifer, as well as two sons, Robbie and Cal. 
He also has three grandchildren, Noah, Emma, and Carson. Congratulations, Mr. Law. Thank you for your service to our country, our community, and above all, our organization. Awesome. All right. Good evening, Madam Chair, school board members, and Ms. Beeman. My name is Brittany Campbell, and it is an honor to serve as an assistant principal at Crooms Academy of Information Technology. Tonight, we would like to recognize the Crooms Business Advisory Council. The Crooms BAC is nationally recognized as an exemplar council by the National Academy Foundation. The BAC is made up of business leaders serving and supporting students, teachers, and administration. The council aligns with the vision and mission of our academy to help prepare our young people throughout their high school career and beyond. They provide an array of support and opportunities for our students through teaching, junior achievement, job shadowing, senior portfolio interviews, internships, and of course, the Seminole County Tech Fest. This summer alone, our BAC is supporting 44 paid student internships, allowing our students, <laughs> yes, allowing our students to earn high school credit, income, and a valuable experience. Since 2006, the Crooms BAC has raised $383,000 built an endowment of $100,000 with, uh, here with the Foundation of Seminole County Public Schools, and awarded $201,000 in student scholarships, a remarkable legacy in which we could all be proud. When I call your name, please come forward and remain standing. First up, our BAC chair for 18 years, R.T. Hillary from Arl... RLH Consulting and Management Company. Next up, we have our BAC Internship Chair, Bill Mills from FPP Correlation. Next is Terry Chandler from United Data Technologies Incorporated. Next up is Janine Stafford from Verizon Communications in Lake Mary, Florida. Next is Levita Hayes from Living Legacies with Levita. Next is Ann Hall from Lockheed Martin Corp. Next is Paul Meehan from Meehan Handyman Services, LLC. Next is Tiana Hale from the City of Winter Springs. And last to represent our BAC for tonight is our very own Secretary of our Crooms PTSA, Chris Giddings.
I, I forgot the most important part. We're going to do it after the picture. I'm just kidding. Here's our next check we want to present for $5,000, which takes us up to $105,000 in the endowment that we have here with Seminole County. members and Superintendent Beeman, it is my pleasure to introduce our newest elementary assistant principal, Mrs. Lindsay Todd. Mrs. Todd, come on up. <laughs> Mrs. Todd is a product of Seminole County Public Schools and is going to, into her 17th year of education. She taught at Keith Elementary. She was the school administration manager at Idlewild Elementary. She served as the assistant principal at Lawton Elementary and Winter Springs Elementary. She ex is excited to be a part of the Layer community and have this wonderful opportunity to serve as principal. With her tonight are family members. Husband Adam, please stand. Two sons, Carter and Jackson, come on up. Parents, Karen and Roger Quick. Grandparent Richard Koloff and Frankie Cruz. Come on up, family. Fun fact her grandmother, Frankie Cruz, was with Seminole County Public Schools for 35 years. Wow. Yeah. Smile. Okay, all right. Next, we have our focus on student achievement. No, not yet. Mr. Mr. Oh. Anderson. Yep. If you would come on up to the podium, Mr. Anderson. Thank you. <laughs> I don't need my, I can speak loud. How's everybody doing? <laughs> I can do, you can do better than that. I know it's kind of late today, but how's everybody doing? Excellent, excellent. 
Look at you, you guys look wonderful. I'm a little nervous because I've never been in the school board chamber. I'm usually in the county chamber, but this is fantastic. Thank you for the invitation, thank you for having me. I'm Chris Anderson, I'm the supervisor of elections here in Seminole County. And I wanted to come by here and I wanted to give everyone an update on this wonderful program that we partner with the school board on, and that is voter registration of all of our young people in our high school. So, uh, if you are 16 years old or, or 17, you can pre-register to vote. Most people don't know that. Well, the school board and my office, we partner with each other to accomplish that goal. And it is fantastic. You know, nothing is more rewarding than being at the polling location and a young person walk up to me and say, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, you registered me to vote. And I voted. See, I believe that voting is a physical representation of your ideals, your beliefs, and your principles. When you vote, you believe that you're making things better for yourself, for the people around you. So when you vote, it truly represents who you are. So to see young people engaging in the process, taking ownership, it's vitally important. And I am very appreciative of the school board, of the superintendent for allowing us to come in and make sure that that happens for young people. Thank you so much. And there's one other person I'd like to thank. In order to have a successful organization, you have to have a very strong team. We believe in people. People make the process. Kendall, please stand up for a second. Kendall Cobb is our community service coordinator. <laughs> Kendall just came on board with us, but he is a spectacular young man, and he understands uh, how I feel about folks taking part in our process, and he uh, when you see all those great um, uh, posts that we have on the website or anything that's really sparkling for our organization, Kendall's chiefly involved in that. So, Kendall, thank you very much for everything you do for our organization. Let's get to it. Am I controlling this? It's on me. Gotcha. So, as you can see, we do a couple of different things at different levels. So, I'll start with uh, elementary. Uh, we do the Sunshine State reading. So we come in for these for the our littlest uh, students, and they get a chance to actually vote in an actual voting booth, just like many of us use. They get to use an actual DS200 tabulation machine, a real ballot to vote for their favorite book. And it's really cool. They love it. They're so super energetic when they see them. And they ask me for my autograph, too, so that's cool. <laughs> and we got to do something a little bit different this year. Uh, we got to do the micro society for uh, Oviedo. Uh, they have a, a city essentially that they run as young people and I found this to be so fantastic uh, to get them involved in understanding the importance of different levels of government. And they had an election for their, for their government leaders. And these young people came in, and I'm not kidding, they had a voter registration card, they had a sample ballot. I mean, they were literally prepared voters. Uh, might I say more prepared than some voters I run into. So just remember, so I'll put this plug in real quick. Your sample ballot's always available to all of you 24 hours, seven days a week on, your, on our website at voteseminal.org. All right, so that's what we got to do for our elementary kids. And that was really, really special. Uh, middle school got to go teach in. And I got a very nice certificate from the school board for doing a teach-in. That was cool. The kids were super, super excited to, to see us come in. And I do a, a kind of a cool exercise with them. So I know music is one of the ways to get to young people. I still can't convince Kendall to allow us to get a TikTok. I, <laughs> I, can, I have some moves, Kendall. I can dance a little bit, I have a little rhythm. Um, I'm still working on that. But uh, I know that's a way to get to young people. So, you know, we talk about, okay, well, in this room, this is uh, a country, and we're gonna vote for our favorite genre of music. And the kids will vote on that. And I'll select representatives to come up, and these representatives have to speak to their uh, constituents about the genre of music in which they enjoy. And at the end, I have a president that will then uh, sign the bill after it's been voted on by members of Congress, and, they, and I go through, well, this is what happens if you don't participate. You may be listening to perhaps uh, rock and roll, and that may not be your favorite genre of music or country or rap or whatever it is. And it kind of hits home to them as to why it's so important to vote. And that's what makes it really, really cool to go into the middle schools, the high schools. 
that's always a challenge, right? Because in high school, you got to be cool, you know? You don't want to be, you know, yeah, I'm here, you know what I'm saying, but, you know, I'm here. And then I have to engage him, and I got to get him interested. So I talk to him why I believe it's important to vote. Being an African American, being a combat veteran, I tell them stories about my, my, my time in service, and I tell them stories about my grandmother, who first got an opportunity to vote in 1951, and her experience. And I'll never forget one of the young people said to me, the bell had rung, and I knew I had hit it home because they were like, dang, man, I wanted to hear the rest of the story. So, you know, going and, and talking to, to the high school kids can be a bit of a challenge, but I, I, I find a way to connect with them. And, of course, we register them to vote. We go through all the amendments and the voting evolution and why it's important. So, as I explained, you can register to vote. Uh, you can pre-register between ages 16 and 17. And as a birthday present from our office to those young people, we automatically add them to the voter roll when they turn 18. It's pretty cool. Here's some, uh, some of our uh, voter registration drives. Now, this is an award-winning uh, program, by the way that we all, bo uh, both organizations have uh, participated. And what we do is, as I, after I go into my little spill, I'll invite some elected officials in. And a lot of them are here today, right now. Um, and even Commissioner Hale from, from the, the city of Winter Springs. If I go to Winter Springs High School, I will usually reach out to the school board members first, and I'll reach out to city commissioners, county commissioners, and I'll say, okay, what do you want to talk about? What's important to you right now? Well, I want a Chick-fil-A in the high school. That's what, that's what the most of them will tell me. Want a chick <laughs> okay. Oh, we want to have our lunchroom just like Lake Brent. Okay. Well, who do we talk to about that? And, you know, they'll say the school board, and I'll say, okay, well, who's the school board member for this particular area? And they'll look in their voter guide that we all give them, which is available to all of you on our website at VoteSeminole.org. And they will find out who represents their area. And I'll say, okay, well, you know what? I'm gonna call them. Let's, do you think they're gonna pick up the phone? And I'm like, Psh. they're not gonna answer. Now, of course, I've worked it out with the elected official who's sitting in the back. And, you know, it, it's so cool, because I'll call and they answer the phone and they all know the drill here. They've done it many, many times. And uh, the kids in the back will be like, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, an elected official's actually here. They're listening to our concerns. And I will tell you that a lot of change has come from those conversations that the members of the school board have had, another elected officials, and the young people see that, wow, my elected officials uh, here in Seminole County are engaged and interested in what I have to say. And it really means a lot to us. So we got to do something pretty cool. This is a kind of new for us, which is the SGA elections. We've done it at the ninth grade center in, uh, at Seminole High School. Uh, Mrs. Jackson, she, she called me over and had me do it. And it was really cool because my son was in ninth grade, so I got to embarrass him while I was there. And then, Yo, CJ, what's up, man? Daddy love you. <laughs> it was really cool to come over and do their uh, SGA, uh, which is their student government election, and we got to do it for Lyman this time. 416 young people got a chance to vote uh, on a real live ballot. They got a chance to use an actual DS-200, and they participated in voting in their own election. So we were happy to participate in that. As I talked about the teach-ins, as you can see, they get super excited. I'm telling them to wave their hands back and forth. They're like, yeah, let's go. And we're talking about all the different types of government, the forms of government in the world, and and the importance of being involved. So I really get a, 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 a kick out of going to our middle schools and seeing them just before they enter high school. Sunshine State, as I explained, we visited 15 elementary schools, 2,865 young people got a chance to vote for their favorite book. And that's what's really neat is to see these kids at a very, very young age already learning the muscle memory of filling in that oval target, placing their ballot into a tabulation machine, and getting that satisfaction from actually being a part of the process. And as you can see, the bottom right corner down there, the lights are out. This is the truth. Voting will continue even when the power goes out. Imagine that. <laughs> We are prepared at the elections office. This actually happens quite a bit because, I don't know if you know this, fun fact. 
the most active part of the hurricane season is early during early voting for the general election. Yes, let's make it even more difficult for Chris. So Stentrum Elementary, as I talked about the micro Oviedo election, we got a chance to allow 487 kids from, from, K, from kindergarten to fourth grade vote. And they got to vote for their leaders. And like I said, these were some pretty prepared individuals. They had their own voter registration cards. They had their sample ballots ready to go. I was like, I don't even need to be here right now. You already know what to do. Please make your way to the voting booth. And they did it with great pride. And I was very happy to see that. So again, thank you to the Seminole County School Board and to the superintendent for allowing us to participate and come into the schools and register our young people, giving me the personal opportunity to connect with them, explain to them why I believe it's important to vote, why they should continue to vote. Thank you so much. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And if you don't have any questions for me, that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. You, I Chris. just would like to say thank you. Thank you from all of us. All right, now we have our Focus on Student Achievement presentation. Good evening, Chair Pennick, board members, Superintendent Beeman. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Thompson and I are going to use our Focused on Student Achievement segment tonight to give you the first of, of what will probably be some periodic updates on the changes to Florida's uh, assessment system and eventually our new accountability system. So we will um, take you through um, what we, uh, what we know today, what we still don't know today, and then we will uh, be happy to take your So just a reminder, board members, we are uh, moving in 22-23 to the FAST system. That's Florida's assessment of student thinking. This is the official replacement for the Florida standards assessment that um, we have just uh, bid farewell to. Um, and a reminder that this work began in 2019 with the governor's executive order to begin a review of the standards. And anytime you have a standard transition um, from, in this case, from Florida standards to the best standards, you then have to realign your assessment system. And um, so we had been, uh, we knew that this would eventually come, um, but some of the, the, the structures and the details are, are very different from the system, again, that, um, that uh, we are um, finishing up with. So we just want to, again, give you an overview tonight and share some of what we've learned recently. So the FAST uh, system will be different in that there are two components. And um, the, the, beyond the acronyms BEST and FAST, you're going to hear PM quite often next year, PM Progress Monitoring. And uh, Progress Monitoring, of course, has been in Florida's years, but it's always been a decentralized process with each district selecting its um, curriculum products, systems, um, and progress monitor assessments, the state as part of the assessment relaunch will now provide progress monitors. So there are two components. Um, PM1 and PM2 are kind of the official progress monitors. Those will be given um, in English language arts from VPK up through grade 10 and in math from grades K through 8. Now, the end of course uh, exams at secondary um, will, uh, will continue separately from FAST. Um, the um, students 
FSA retake to graduate high school will still have access to that, and then science is not part of the system either. M3, Progress Monitor 3, will be the official statewide standardized assessment, the higher stakes piece um, that will be um, you know, impactful to both students in terms of their uh, kind of year-end score, um, but also eventually to schools and districts with accountability. At this point, we believe that accountability will remain at grades three through 10 for English language arts and grades three through eight. That's also consistent with the federal Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, algebra one and geometry end of course exams will continue again outside of the system um, with um, realignment to best standards and a reduction to single session assessments. That will be a feature that you'll see throughout. We currently are accustomed to taking a, a single test over two days. The new system will reduce to one day and that's where a lot of the test time reduction that we've heard about. Although again, we, we don't have all of those details yet. So, you know, again, in terms of a, a broad overview, tests will continue at the specific, you know, or by subject and by grade level. Um, the, you know, all of the items will be aligned to standards as they have been, um, you know, in our previous uh, system. All of the items covering um, that grade level content. Another significant change is that all testing at all grade levels will be computer-based. Um, and again, one subject area per day will be the source of the reduction in testing time that, that has been um, widely um, touted as a, a feature of this new system. Finally, there will be limited remote testing um, for two specific groups of students, full-time virtual students across the state and hospital homebound students will access PM1 and PM2 remotely. The PM3, the, the, the statewide standardized assessment that's higher stakes, um, will not be remote. And again, that'll just be in the um, FAST system, not in the tests that are still outside of that. One of the pieces related to computer-based testing is that the new FAST system, once it's fully implemented, your adaptive test. So rather than a series of pre-selected items, each student having a slightly different test experience based upon their response to each question and whether that response is correct or incorrect. So of questions correctly is going to get progressively more difficult items. Uh, a student answering multiple questions incorrectly will get progressively simpler items within that grade span. The idea here then is that each student's test um, uh, experience is unique. Um, one of the takeaways from, from this is we'll have to really communicate with parents and students about in, in that experience with adaptive testing, right? So a student working well on grade level, um, walking away and saying that's a hard test, maybe as a result of getting many answers correct and working at the top of that grade band. So again, have to, that'll be part of the kind of communication plan. We'll have to get students younger grades more accustomed to adaptive. Finally, um, one of our wonderings throughout much of the year was what would happen with the writing test. Um, this is a, a newer piece of information we've received. OE has now confirmed that writing will continue as part of the FAST assessment um, system. Next year, uh, we will go through field testing, so districts and schools will be selected um, to participate in that in order to um, get a baseline and, 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 and fine-tune the system. We know that, again, writing is typically given before the other tests, in this case, likely, likely in the um, beginning of April. Uh, the test will also be computer-based, so students will be typing. There will be machine scoring, and we obviously have many questions about that, but we know that that's uh, the current plan. The writing score will be reported separately from the ELA score, so both students and parents will get a, a score on that writing, and then we know that those scores, of course, can be aggregated for accountability school grade purposes. So, update on the writing test. Um, our um, 
list of unknowns um, is shrinking uh, gradually. A few of the unknowns that were still there are others um, further down the road on the accountability system. Um, but again, we know that this will be a shorter assessment than the FSA. We still don't know the test lengths or the number of items um, within a session. The test length is particularly important because it um, then determines for our test coordinators how they set up their, their school day, how many um, students can test um, at, you know, on a specific day, and that, that kind of then determines the structure of the test window um, at each school. Um, still lots of questions about um, how results will be reported, the formats. Um, there's some language about how quickly that information has to be um, turned around for um, both teachers and parents, but what the reports look like um, is a lot of questions about accommodations for um, English language learners, students with disabilities some of the rules for remote testing, and then finally how um, information is going to flow between between districts during the year. So again, those are just some of the unknowns. There are a lot more when we talk about, you know, what the future accountability system will look like, but this is what we have um, soon, knowing that we'll be giving this um, first assessment sometime in August. So Mrs. Thompson is going to take you through some of the implementation details for next year that we uh, have received and kind of the timeline by which we Thank you. Um, as Dr. Weisong said, um, we've learned a lot about the assessment and our team in assessment and accountability is busy partnering with school leaders to determine how this will be um, implemented in schools at the beginning of the school year. So we hope to, um, information is evolving, so um, this slide rec uh, represents some of the planning timelines that are underway. Um, the first of the Department of Education trainings is going to occur this week, and um, our team will be well represented at that training. It is for the FAST 3 through 10 um, implementation, and we are um, taking with us some selected school-based test coordinators because we feel it's important for them to hear this, the, the training directly from DOE, and then they're going to collaborate with our team to try to develop training for our school leaders. Um, Training for FAST VPK and K2 will occur in July. Um, those will be through the Renaissance platform, so the Renaissance um, trainers will be conducting that training, and again, we will be well represented at both of those trainings with, with district staff to bring that back to our schools. We are scheduled to have our um, testing kickoff for school-based test coordinators during the administrative professional development sessions at Tuscola Middle School on July 19th through the 21st. July 19th, we'll train our elementary coordinators, and on July by 20th, we'll train our secondary coordinators. Um, it is the goal that we begin rostering students into the testing platforms during the week of August 15th, so we will begin that process right away on our campuses. Our timelines, uh, the windows represented here are the windows that have been designated by the state for the progress monitors. Um, so those windows are roughly about six weeks long um, with the flexibility for districts to define within that window when they want to give these assessments. We're currently working with district leaders on our district, a draft of our district assessment calendar and which we will um, further define when these, these assessments will take place. You'll see with PM1 um, that for our students in VPK through grade two, Assessments of those students must occur within the first 30 days of school. So um, we will prioritize um, getting those assessments kicked off near the beginning of the window to accommodate that requirement. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Results and scoring. Um, for the 22-23 school year, uh, results and the scoring of these assessments for the for the FAST VPK through two, all the scores um, will utilize the Renaissance scoring and reporting platform. So that is a very robust platform that provides a lot of information for both teachers and for parents in terms of what these um, these are these are early learning um, assessments that have been in place for a long time. So that will be a, a fully developed platform for their use. Um, for FAST um, three through ten, the platform that we will use is one that our school leaders are very familiar with. We hope to learn more about um, the reporting and kind of how that's going to work with that platform at the training for this week, so we'll know a little bit more about that um, once we come back from there. P1 
PM1 and PM2 to help our teachers understand the data. We'll have an FSA aligned um, one through five achievement score as well as a statewide percentile rank. Um, so kind of what that means is our students are gonna take the test and as Dr. Weisong referenced, when they take PM1, they are gonna see the full depth and breadth of the content of that course. So a fourth grader will experience content of the entirety of fourth grade curriculum, though they've only been in fourth grade for maybe two weeks. So we, we know that how the, that there's gonna be a lot of growth for that student over the course of the year. So when we get that test back for that student, it may say this student's score is aligned to an FSA level two. But then it will also say this student scored in the 85th percentile compared to their peers. So why it may say a projected level two, two weeks into fourth grade with very little exposure to content, that student is, per is performing well above their peers throughout the state. So that will help parents get some, get some understanding and teachers get some understanding as we become familiar with the data, what it means and how to use it. So they're gonna kind of use that um, plan this first year to give us context for that data. Um, when PM3, when the students take Progress Monitor 3, um, which will be the summative assessment at the end of the year, um, those scores will be linked to FSA scores for this year. So they'll, they'll have a, they'll link us back to FSA level three, what equates to an FSA level three and above, or um, FSA levels one and two for this year only. Um, once they have that data in their system, they'll start the standard setting process. So typically that begins with convening committees of various stakeholders, and they look at results and they make recommendations about where those cut scores are at each grade level and at each subject area for where we're gonna have the, the cut score from level one to level two, level two, level three. And once those levels are established, then um, they'll, they'll share that, in, that information then goes forward through a process um, with members of the legislature and the state board for approval for those things. So they hope to have the standard setting done by the summer and early fall for these assessments. There will be five achievement levels. That was a statutory requirement and those achievement levels will be equated to grade level performance. We've used terms in the past like proficiency or we've used terms like satisfactory performance. Fast assessments, level three and above are all, level three is considered a passing score and at grade level. Level four and five will be considered above grade level and levels one and two below grade level. So that's just a difference in the terminology as it relates to this assessment system. Can I ask a question on that before you go forward? Of course. Are, we're going to educate our teachers on PM1 and 2 and how it's FSA aligned, but I feel like we need to do parent education as well because just it, it scared me to when you're saying what you're saying, how many parent calls we're going to get and the fears we're going to have to kind of quash that, that they're not off grade, they're not off topic, it's just an early assessment. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Yes, that is certainly part of our, that's part of our communication plan. Like I said, as we develop a better understanding, um, like I said, we're hoping they're gonna share with us what the, what the scores that the parents will receive will look like and the timeline for that. So yes, we intend to develop some uh, resources for parents in terms of how to, how to interpret the scores, how to make meaning out of those scores. We also want to um, share with parents um, how to kind of talk with their student about an adaptive test because it's kind of daunting when a, when a, when a student who's a fairly high performing student comes home and says, I answered all these questions wrong, I don't feel good about what I did um, because it is adaptive and, it, and this assessment was pushing that student to the top of the grade level band. So we wanna develop some resources for parents to have conversations with their students about adaptive testing and, and, how, and how they should feel about it and how that, what that will look like to them as well as the resources associated with the scoring. So yes, that will certainly be part of what we put together and do once we gain a better understanding of what parents can expect to see. All right, thank you. So as we um, kind of contemplate moving forward and some of the, the statutory requirements associated with assessments are still in place even during this transition. So for 22-23, grade promotion for, to fourth grade is still t is tied to statutory, to the statute on performance on the state mandated assessment. So FAST level two performance will be linked to what is a commensurate performance on the FSA level, on the FSA. So they'll do, a, they'll, they'll do an alignment between that. So they'll establish a score for the FAST third progress monitor that represents the score that students have to have in order to be promoted to grade four. 
all of the good cause, um, ex all the good cause exceptions and options will be in place. So those will those will be available for next year as well. And they also have added um, a little bit of flexibility for districts that districts can promote students based upon a criteria that we have created that is provides statistical reliable evidence of the student's performance. This is very similar to what we did last year. Of course, in 2020 there was no testing, and we we had a different methodology of promoting students. Last year, they allowed um, districts to develop their own criteria um, for that placement. So we will be, um, assessment and accountability does that work. So we will be reexamining our criteria from last year, making sure it's still st statistically um, valid and it gives us that reliable evidence of performance. And we'll have that as an option for our rising fourth graders for next year. Graduation requirements are also still in place. Um, so the department will provide us a fast aligned score for FSA grade 10 and for the best algebra one test. So when the students are 10th grade students that are taking the progress the third progress monitor in English two, um, we'll get that score and we'll have a we'll have a score that will allow us to check that box that they have met that requirement for graduation and we'll have the same um, type of score that will be available for our students enrolled in algebra one. Um, so that it is aligned to what the prior expectation of performance was on the Algebra 1 EOC. Um, just a reminder that concordance scores do revert to the state board approved scores. Um, as you know, last year, um, the, um, the department granted an exception for the class of 22 that rolled those scores back to, um, to the previous um, concordance scores um, that were a, a little bit lower expectation for SAT PERT was in, in place for Algebra 1 for the class of 22. That will not be the option for the class of 23. They will have to meet the higher concordance scores for ELA and PERT will not be an option as a concordance score score for them for mathematics. Accountability. So once all the scores are in for Progress Monitor 3 and the standard setting has occurred, the state is going to calculate informational baseline grades. This is very similar to what they did when we transitioned from FCAT to FSA. And um, we got a, a, an informational grade or a baseline grade. Um, and we just need to understand that in those grades, there will be no learning gains. And learning gains represent a substantial, um, a substantial weight within the school accountability formula that will not be part of these informational grades. The informational grades will be based on that grade level performance metric um, in, in those assessment plus uh, the, the other um, acceleration factors. To, um, one of the things that they, the state has said that they're going to do is that they are going to make the percentage of schools that earn grades A through F in the 22-23 school year statistically equivalent to those results from 21-22. Um, and those grades will probably not be released until winter because they have to go through the standard setting process first. Those standards, those, level, those achievement levels have to be approved and then they'll calculate those baseline informational grades. Just a, something that we had not touched upon before in Senate Bill 2524, which was a budget conforming bill, there was a piece of this bill that um, addressed some, it was called an escalator clause in um, school accountability. So basically, once the percentage of, of schools earning grades of A or B in the current year is 75% of all graded schools in a particular school type, then the state board must reset the minimum percentage of points. Um, at each grade for each grade to the next highest percentage of the numeral five or zero. So, so right now, um, the 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 cut to get an A is 62% of the points possible. At the point where 75% of the eligible schools are making A's and B's, <clears throat> they would then have to move that cut up to 65. And then once we hit that, they would move it up to 70. Um, so that that escalator clause was signed and will become part of our accountability world um, as we move forward. The last update we want to provide to you this evening is, is more of a local piece and probably the number one question that we've heard from our school-based administrators, our, our principals and, and many of our teachers, especially at K through eight, is what will happen with iReady as a result of um, this move to a new state assessment system. And um, iReady um, as a company has, fully updated the product to be aligned with the best standards. And so 
we, we've had um, dialogue with them about um, you know, their, their, their curriculum, their product, and, and its future in the district, and we've done a lot of listening um, to our staff regarding their needs. And in particular, the assistant superintendents have spent time with their principals, and certainly the principals have consulted with their teachers. The staff recommendation will be to continue the use of iReady for one additional year, um, and there are multiple um, reasons for that recommendation. First, um, with the realignment, iReady can remain uh, a part of our core uh, instruction, that 30 minutes per week uh, of um, reading and math instruction in the system. And, and really that connects to that last bullet point with mm -hmm. standards changing with all new instructional materials in ELA and math, iReady would be the one piece of continuity that our teachers would of going into the next year. Um, that also means it serves as a triangulation tool as we get all of this new data um, in a new reporting format and we sit back and, and try to figure out what does it really mean if we have the iReady data um, that we have um, a long-term history with, um, it, it may provide us with um, better information and allow us to see more clearly as we move through um, the curriculum transition next year. And finally, iReady can continue to be a tier two intervention tool um, when we are identifying students who need additional supports in order to be successful on grade level. So we, uh, again, as a, a staff, are gonna recommend the continued use of iReady at K through eight ELA and math next year. We're working through the implementation details, um, including um, what those, um, iReady diagnostics will look like and certainly trying to align the windows where they are outside of the fast testing windows. We feel confident that we'll be able to do that. We still have some calendars in draft, getting feedback from the assistant superintendents and their principals about how to schedule this out. So the, the current plan um, is to bring a one-year contract um, for 22-23 to the board, hopefully at the July 27th meeting um, and with board approval, then we would be able to let our teachers know that this would be the one um, piece of continuity going into the next school year. Questions? Um, yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, I understand that the, we have the buy-in finally for iReady that teachers uh, really like that. It sounds to me like we're adding more testing because they will be doing both. Is that correct? Am I understanding correctly? There will be more testing. It, overall testing time, in turn, we'll, pro we'll probably see a decrease based upon the changes with the progress monitors. Um, I think we'll know more about that once the state tells us how long those progress monitors are and the number of items. I okay. think it is their intent that overall the state testing footprint decreases. Ours is staying the same as it's been as there's decreases. So over the course of this year, we will see some reduction. Um, I think our hope is to, as, as, as Dr. Weisslong mentioned, that triangulation piece, we have brand new standards, brand new materials, all those are, and we're gonna have this brand new piece of data that for, so a teacher is gonna look at that and say, well, the system says it means this, but I've never used this material, I've never used these standards before. What does iReady say that it uses? And when you and they, and they know iReady, and they're, they're, they know how students perform in that. So to be able to look at that fast result next to that iReady result, that will build our. And, and what we hope to see is that there is consistency and alignment between those outcomes that will help our teachers gain confidence mm -hmm. in using these fast assessments for instructional decisions once they become familiar with the reporting and how it aligns to their curriculum. And um, so, like I said, it's a one-year opportunity for that overlap as we as part of our transition. So overall, the state footprint will 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 decrease. Ours will stay the same or reduce depending upon those final decisions with iReady. Right now, we're giving three iReady diagnostics. We may not give three diagnostics moving forward. So that would be also an, a contraction of, of district testing time in terms of that. Okay. Can, can I add just an extra yeah, sure. question onto that one? And then will you also include that in the messaging to parents that they're gonna be duplicative testing 
to help them understand why we're doing it? So, so yes, I think that needs to be part of the messaging, and that's why we wanted to start talking about it now. Um, but I, I think the additional point is that really the, um, the, the, the triangulation piece is, it becomes a byproduct. The real key to the iReady diagnostics is that's establishing that learning path that the student is going to go down for curriculum purposes. So the state progress monitor system is simply a data point with no up next step. Right, whereas the iReady is giving you a learning path based on skill work that needs to happen. So I, I, I think that in that messaging is distinguishing between we're not really duplicating because we're not getting the same outcome. We're getting two different data points um, but, and, and, and they'll be used for different purposes, one of which is, again, building that learning path out. Time, um, with that fast data. Okay, um, and to add on, if it's still um, my turn, is there, um, I understand we may not use iReady for all three assessments. Um, is, you know, practice makes perfect and the adaptive testing. Um, the experience that the students have, I feel like I, I hope that they get to get to do the adaptive testing. I mean, the, the more you take it, the, the more times you take the SAT, the better you do, you know, and so. The, the good news is I, I ready is, a, is an adaptive test. I, yes. I ready moves around, so our, our students are, have experience with that. Um, who have been working with I ready? Um, our students in um, K two will have a full adaptive experience, and as as the the depth and the breadth of items for the grades three and above assessments grow, it will get and it will get more adaptive, um, kind of as it goes as it goes along for students. So it, it really will be able, I think, to give teachers some some really good information um, about where students are. Um, the department has been very clear that it'll probably be 24, 25 before we see full adaptivity in grades three and above because that, that just, it takes that long to go through the statistical analysis and the psychometrics associated with building those item banks so that we get good outcomes for students. Okay. Um. Uh, just a physical concern, do we have the bandwidth to handle all of the testing days and is it your department that will have to do the master scheduling for all of the grades? Um, what, what our department does is we create, um, we create um, a district assessment schedule and then we work, um, we work very, very closely with our school-based test coordinators and we help them with how to develop those tests. And, and it does look different on each campus or how to develop the testing schedule. Resources vary from one campus to the other, but um, we, have, um, we have three very skilled district level test administrators who are assigned to each one of the instructional levels and they meet with them, talk with them. We look at their schedules with them. We talk with them about that in terms of what makes sense on their campus, with their resources, with their students. Our department has been um, working with our information services team regarding the number of devices, the availability of devices, as well as the network supporting capacities. And um, Mr. Everland's team will, will work with our team to make sure that our schools have the support that they need to be successful with the assessments. Okay. And that does it for my questions. Thank you. Dr. Calderon, do you have any questions? Yes, ma'am, I do. So while we're talking about technology, I almost feel like this is Groundhog Day all over again. Back in the early FSA days when Seminole County came up with the Sunshine Solution. My concern, especially for my VP, VPK through two, in that this is an online progress monitoring assessment, I'm concerned about those students of ours who perhaps don't have the keyboarding and or technology experiences that their counterparts in other classes can. So I wanna ensure that we're actually testing knowledge of the child, not the ability to utilize the technology to take this assessment. So I hope that 
we are developing something for our team to help those students to get them up to speed to make sure that the use of technology in these assessments is not going to hurt them and make the division wider between the haves and the have-nots in our society. Dr. Calderon, I, I too felt like it was Groundhog Day as we kind of, when we went back to the computer-based testing, and I, I remember those conversations from 2015, I think it was, um, and I know that was a concern that we had then. Um, the Renaissance system is very, very friendly to early literacy and early learning. It has been used um, throughout the country, um, so I, I think it's a great system for us to do the early grades with. We'll find out a lot more about that at the upcoming trainings in terms of how that works. Um, we do know that um, our our VPK through two kids will have, they'll have headsets that they'll need, so they'll be listening to prompts. Our students have been interacting with computer-based testing as part of iReady Diagnostics and early grades. So there is some familiarity there that this will be a different system. So that's something certainly our, um, our early learning teams and our elementary teams will be looking at to ensure that we have the support needed for that and that we can, um, we kind of can see in those results what we're looking for. Great, I, I just really want us to support our team to give them time during the day to be able to take that out as a barrier because I totally agree in the concept of progress monitoring because we want to inform instruction, we just don't wanna have a grade, but to be able to really inform instruction, I need to know if it's really the student's knowledge base or if it's their keyboarding skills. And then if I could add one more thing, Madam Chair, to piggyback on what you brought up of communications to the families, I really almost feel we almost need a focus group internally on this because our families are such an important link um, in the success for our students and I wanna be totally transparent with this and I can't thank the two of you enough for the phenomenal presentation you gave us but I have to be honest when I say perhaps not every single family of a student listened tonight. Um, so I, I want to be able to, in a very concise manner, not only share the information that Chairman suggested to our parents, but I think they have to also understand the concordant scores of what perhaps will be taken away um, that has been known in past years because many of our families are working with their students in making sure that they're successful and I think we need to um, educate and over-educate our community of different pathways. So that would be my other comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Calderon. Any other questions, comments? All right, thank you both. Wonderful presentation, appreciate it. Um, board items for discussion. Member Krause, do you have anything? I do not, thank you. Member Almond? I do not, Madam Chair. Member Calderon? I do not, I'll save for board committee reports. Okay, and I don't have anything as well. Uh, Member Krause, will you please read the public comment statement? Policy 0169.1, public participation at board meetings. The purpose of the public participation segment of the board meeting is to allow the public to address matters within the board's jurisdiction and not for resolving individual grievances or disputes. Public comments related to education, the board agenda, and the district are welcome and encouraged. To maintain orderly conduct, the public comment segment of the meeting may not be used as an open forum to discuss matters unrelated to education, to support or oppose candidates for public office, including presentation of political and or campaign issues, announcing candidacy and or campaigning, or to engage in commercial speech, attempting to sell a service or product to the board or the public. Nor is it a forum to address matters involving disciplinary actions of any kind, pending claims, complaints, or litigation against the district or district personnel. 
Also, public comment is not a form to engage in personal attacks against school system employees or board members. Statements made by a member of the public shall be limited to three minutes duration. One designated group representative speaking on a proposition before the board will have a maximum of six minutes. No speaker may yield his or her time to any other person. Substitutions of speakers will not be allowed except in exceptional circumstances as determined by the presiding officer. Speakers shall direct their comments only to the board and may not address the audience or other speakers. This policy does not prohibit the board from maintaining orderly conduct or proper decorum in a public meeting. Thank you. Um, we will start with Caden Bryant, followed by Haley Donahue, followed by Matthew O'Connor. Hello, my name is Caden Bryant and I'm a senior at Oviedo High School. Every time I think the board is making progress, they take 10 steps backward. I was thrilled that many of you listened to the issue with the Lyman yearbook situation and took actual action to amend the initial decision, but here we are again discussing LGBTQ plus rights. Many of those who oppose the proclamation claim that it's dividing students, but that's an incredibly immature way of viewing the situation. All we're doing is asking to be acknowledged and supported as neither of those things are currently happening. Saying stuff like, what's next, Redhead Awareness Month, is unbelievably undermining the actual core cause and is plain childish. We're asking for support because queer students are brutally bullied, raped, murdered, and attempt suicide on a regular basis. I don't know why so many people think that helping a community in desperate need of support is somehow divisive, but that is simply untrue. And for those of you thinking, well, those things happen to straight people too, of course they do, but no straight person is killed for being straight. Gay people are killed for being gay. That is the difference, and it isn't a hard concept to grasp. If you continue to disappoint the LGBTQ plus community with your lack of action, I want you to know that you are all responsible for every instance of bullying, every suicide, every murder, every rape, all of it is on your hands. Does that sound harsh? Good. If you're uncomfortable, good. If you feel that way, just imagine how all of the people who are experiencing those things firsthand must feel. Imagine the gay kid who got cornered in the boys' bathroom and was beaten to death just for loving the same gender. Imagine the trans kid who was followed on the bus ride home and got horrifically raped and murdered. Imagine all of the queer people who have been let down again and again and again by a group of people whose job is to protect them, but instead choose to end their own lives rather than having to live even one more day in a world where we are not safe. How pathetic is it that I, a high school student, have to stand up here and beg for something as simple as safety? This is my fifth time doing this, and none of you have so much as raised a finger to help us, to help me and my struggling community. You should be uncomfortable. You should be embarrassed. You should be ashamed of yourselves. We aren't asking for much, but somehow still nothing at all has been done. Every day I have to watch my fellow students, friends, and family live in a society where we can scream to the world that we need help, but still end up ignored, still end up assaulted, still end up hopeless, still end up dead. Please let this be the last time I ask, help us. Thank you. Order, please. Order, please. Haley Donahue, I'm a recent graduate of Seminole County Public Schools. Let's talk about bullying for a moment. According to the Trevor Project, 52% of LGBTQ plus youths who are enrolled in middle or high school reported being bullied either in person or electronically in one year. One in three, per or one in three students reported being bullied in person, while 42% were bullied electronically. In seventh grade, and to put this in perspective, I graduated high school like less than a month ago, I knew a kid whose favorite go-to insults were derogatory slurs based around being LGBTQ+. He didn't say this because he wanted to insult LGBTQ plus individuals. He said it because he thought that was the worst thing someone could be. A teacher overheard him multiple times and nothing was done to stop him. No change is put in place and those students keep on getting bullied. 
so it goes. Let's talk about book bannings. Different groups wish to ban books under the lens that they are inappropriate for students to read. These books have strong leading characters of color or strong leading LGBTQ plus characters or strong female leads. These books discuss racism and homophobia and transphobia and sexism. These books apparently aren't suitable for us to read. Books about the history of America, the history of women's rights and the history of LGBTQ plus individuals are banned. These books get removed quietly and they don't always come back. So it goes. Let's talk about school shootings. At the end of middle school, right after Parkland, there was a code red on my middle school campus. I was shoved into a cabinet next to my best friend and I was hoping that we would both survive. I was praying that I would not have to go home and tell my mother or her parents that I sat next to my best friend while she got shot. I was praying that I was going to make it home alive. I was praying that if the man came into my classroom, he wouldn't check the cabinets. But sure, let's arm teachers because a good guy with a gun is going to stop a bad guy with one. So it goes. But you know what? I'm tired of that. So it goes, so it goes, so it goes. Vonnegut can keep his freights. I know that you can't change everything. You can't stop people in other parts of the country from banning books. You can't urge legislators to push for reforms to keep 13-year-olds from wondering if they were going to die the day their school went under a lockdown. But you can recognize pride. You can uplift members of a community that so often gets pushed to the side. Please recognize pride. And now it changes. Thank you. At Order, Matthew O'Connor. Order so we can hear names, please. Matthew O'Connor. My name is Matthew, and I'm a student at Seminole State College. The name on my license, however, will be different because I'm transgender. Growing up in high school, I didn't know if I was going to make it. There were times when staying home seemed easier than going to school, and giving up seemed easier than this life of hardship. In my sophomore year, I met one supportive staff member who would be instrumental to me still standing here before you today, Susan. When I told her my name, she didn't think twice about respecting it. She would take time out of her work day to ask me if I was doing okay. And if I wasn't, we'd go talk in the safety of her office. She supported me, she advocated for me, she cared about my future. And that one person helped me survive through high school. Imagine what we could do with all. 45% of LGBTQIA youth seriously consider suicide. For trans and non-binary youth, this number is over half. For LGBTQIA youth, acceptance in this world is not guaranteed. Only one in three of us have supportive families. If we don't, we're eight times more likely to attempt suicide. If we don't, school could be the only bright light in a world of darkness and depression. For me, one person was just barely enough for me to get through. Imagine what we could do with all. I don't know what made you, as members of the Seminole County School Board, want to pursue this career choice, but something tells me at least some of you chose this because you care about the lives of your students. I'm telling you that you can make a significant difference in not only the happiness and education of your LGBTQIA students, but in their ability to survive. You want to censor LGBTQIA history, students, and teachers in schools because you're afraid. You're afraid of what it means to be queer or trans. You're afraid of what it means for the future. Well, I'm here to tell you that it means love. It means authenticity. It means community. It means taking every obstacle, every insult, every legislation you throw at us and being ourselves anyway. And for brave people like that, you cannot erase us. You cannot make us disappear, and you cannot silence us. Thank you. Order, please. Susan Jenick, order. Susan Jenick, followed by Claudia Thomas, followed by JJ Holmes and Allison Holmes.
Good evening. My name is Susan Jenick. I'm a resident of the city of Castleberry. Last meeting, there was an agenda item to approve a pride proclamation that was summarily pulled at the last minute. We were so disappointed. I'm back again after having attended the previous meeting <laughs> because I'm struggling to understand why there appears to be such a problem with if issuing a simple proclamation to affirm the existence of a group of people that represents thousands of students, teachers, and staff. I've heard people saying things about how it's such a small group and it shouldn't matter. Thousands of people shouldn't matter. Let's think about that for a second. I looked it up. In 2019, Seminole County Schools had about 70,000 students. Add on top of that, the teachers and the staff that make up, I don't know how many people, I didn't check that out. If a small percentage is, what, what is that, 5% of people? We're talking about 5,000 individuals. How can you consider that a small number? That's twice the number of students who attend Haggerty's High School. That's 5,000 actual human beings. What could be the problem with affirming support for this community? Last night, the city of Oviedo affirmed its LGBTQ plus residents and staff with a, a proclamation. Next Monday, the city of Castleberry will issue a similar proclamation. Kids are the most vulnerable among the members of the LGBTQ plus community. Being out and proud is an act of bravery in the face of a system that continues to condemn and deny your existence. They need your support. To continue to deny them a positive affirmation is an act of hate. And those who oppose this will wear that in your hearts for a long time to come. Order, please. High school board, Claudia Thomas Kay's Land in Sanford. I'm going to tell you a story, and I'll beg your indulgence because I do have a point to be made. Once upon a time, for 42 years to be exact, I lived in Brevard County. A few years ago, I worked there with a group to elect a friend of ours to the school board. Hard work led her to defeating an incumbent who had assumed she would win. Did that incumbent congratulate our candidate and effect a smooth transition? Oh, no, 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 no. Little Tina, guided by House Rep Brandy not so fine, started a certain organization that this and sadly many other school boards now have to listen to. Why tell this story? Here's my big picture. Because sadly, this group has been misled into thinking they have a righteous cause, when in fact they are being steered toward thinking these culture wars are something more than the distraction they really are. These mothers are listening to a certain party that has nothing positive to offer anyone, thus the deflection attempts. I truly feel sorry for them and the time they're wasting continuing the go negative strategy that has been going on since the days of Newt Gingrich. Yes, I'm that old. Um, I can only imagine the good things they could channel that energy into instead. I believe that you as the board responsible for taking care of the students, our future, um, and the teachers you haven't yet lost because of this stupid battle should feel free to ignore their misguided laments and focus on what really matters, providing the best education that you can to all of your kids. And yes, I do mean all black, brown, white, gay, straight, abled, and disabled. And speaking of the gay community, we all know that the school board decided not to even discuss the proclamation in honor of Pride Month. Now we know that the cities of Oviedo and Castleberry are planning to provide such proclamations. And I want to ask, would you be willing to join them? It's not too late. And I would love to believe that this county I moved to, in the hope that it was more open-minded, would prove that I was not wrong. And if not this year, expect us to be back next year and every year thereafter, because I'm not giving up on you all. So do us a solid and do the right thing. AJ Holmes, followed by Allison Holmes, followed by Jen Cousins.
a board member said that all this superintendent beeman members of the school board my name is jj holmes and i'm here to say don't hide the pride a board member said that all the students who have come here and asked the board to post Happy Pride Month on SCPS's social media pages are just a loud minority. That was disrespectful, not only to everyone in the LGBTQIA plus community, but to everyone who spoke here too. When I was writing my speech for tonight, I checked to see what SCPS celebrates on social media. And you know something, y'all have recognized a lot more than Star Wars. Tweeted out Happy Mother's Day, Happy Father's Day, Happy Grandparents Day. Give cookies a shout out. National Salad Month is celebrated in SCPS, and Banana Day. You say Happy Vitamin C Day, funny because only Vitamin C is recognized. I guess the other vitamins are gay. Libraries get a week, and pizza has a day. Popcorn. Candy canes and farmers are all recognized. Apples get a day. Strawberries get a day. And a month too. Even beans get recognized on social media and their CPS. Can you believe it? Something that gives you gas gets acknowledged Order, please. CPS. But pride doesn't. Bullying Prevention Month is in October, and I only know that cause SCPS recognizes it on social media. So how about instead of just tweeting it out again in October you stand up to the bullies here today and show them they won't be tolerated in Seminole County. Just three small words on Twitter. Happy Pride Month is one small step for SCPS, but one giant leap for the LGBTQIA plus community. The bullies think we can't withstand the storm, but what they don't understand is we all came together and formed into a Category 5 hurricane, and we've just made landfall in Seminole County. Happy Pride everybody. Thank you. Order, please. Alison Holmes, Longwood. I'm a real SCPS parent. I don't homeschool. And I'm here tonight to ask the board for help. Well, actually, I'm here to ask the board to return something of mine, something you've taken from me. No, well, like stolen from me. And just to add insult to injury, you've given away what you've stolen from me. According to the governor, I have parental rights. In fact, the same school board members who've snatched away my rights have said parents should decide what's best for their kids. Parents, that would be me. Yet in SCPS, parents have lost the right to have a school district that models love, respect, diversity, and inclusion. We've also lost the right to have a school district that re represents all of us. As a parent, I want SCPS to recognize pride, and this is even more Critical, now the Texas GOP has labeled homosexuality an abnormal lifestyle choice. And we all know where Texas goes, Florida follows. 
So is there a helpline I can call to report that my rights have been misappropriated by members of the school board? Do I call 911? Where do I file a complaint? How do I get my parental rights back? Until you give the real parents in SCPS our parental rights back, these school board meetings will continue to be a clown show of religious fanatics. Although tonight, Mums for Liberty went one better. They stayed away and sent in the Proud Boys to try and threaten the students. Is this really the sort of meeting the board wants? Fanatics who have no students in the district are parachuted in to speak here, to vomit up their bigotry as they contort and convulse with hate. Of course, they never forget to say how they love everyone. And then they immediately call us all groomers. Ironically, it's the people who scream groomers at us who've actually introduced someone oops, to our meetings who is displaying some very troubling behavior towards our kids. This person is surreptitiously filming our kids. And you've got to ask yourself, why would someone want video of our children? And speaking of disgusting behavior, I have screenshots from a social media account of one of your friends in the Mums for Liberty that I'll be giving to the board. She showed up as a follower on my son's social media account, which is very weird and very creepy, right? Anyway, this woman is saying the most vicious and untruthful things on her nasty account, including lies about our school district. These Moms for Liberty say they have the ear of one of the board members. And I say to her, please, please stop pandering to this group and start defending our school district. It's not a loud mouth minority who want pride recognized, it's the majority. Happy Pride, Seminole County Public Schools, and we say gay. Order, please. Order so names can be heard. Jen Cousins, followed by Kathy Savage, followed by Nina Sandberg. Good evening. Um, I would just like to piggyback off of one thing that Allison said, is that yes, I don't see a lot of the Moms for Liberty here tonight, but they did send their Proud Boys outside who harassed me and two of my children on the way into the building, which is something that really needs to be dealt with. Anyway, the United States President Joe Biden proclaimed June 2022 as LGBTQ Pride Month. The Orange County Public School Board proclaimed June 2022 as LGBTQ plus pride and Pulse Remembrance Month. Orange City Mayor, or, I'm sorry, Orlando City Mayor Buddy Dyer and Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings both officially recognized June as Pride Month. Last night, the city of Oviedo proclaimed June as LGBTQ Pride Month. So it leaves me wondering why did this board scrap plans at the very last minute two weeks ago to vote on a Pride Month proclamation? After an earlier embarrassment for this school district when they initially sought to buy stickers to cover pride flags in a yearbook, why would you let your LGBTQ plus students and staff down once again? This board has shown nothing but apathy for a marginalized group of young people who already suffer unnecessary bullying in school just because they dare to live their lives authentically. These kids pour their hearts out to you at every meeting and you choose to listen instead to the bigotry and bullying of the blue Sherpa grade and refer to the kids trying to live their truths as loud minorities. I think you'll find, in fact, that it is the other way around. As educators and parents, you should be ashamed and you should not be treating these kids as lesser, unwanted people than their cis hetero counterparts. I have a child who is non-binary and I thank my stars that we live in Orlando and have gracious, loving, and accepting board members like Angie Gallo and Karen Caster Dental who would never allow this sort of bullying by adults to happen to children. There are only nine days left in Pride Month. Are you going to stand on the right side of history or will you choose to cower once again behind the dais and let your inactions traumatize your LGBTQ plus students and faculty once again? This board needs to do better. LGBTQ plus lives matter. Your job requires empathy and a duty to protect all children, not just those of the bigoted, bitter extremists. Please say gay and please say trans. Order people, please. Order so we can hear names. Uh, good evening.
evening, Superintendent Beeman and board members. I'm Kathy Savage, and I'm from Oviedo. I wrote you regarding the low level of teacher morale, uh, resulting in part from the comments at the school board meetings and on social media. These comments demoralize teachers by accusing us of indoctrinating children politically, grooming children sexually, and call out anyone who does not agree with us as pedophiles. Two of you responded to my letter and said that you are open to suggestions. Thank you, Karen. So I have some. I would hope that you suspend streaming public comments. Sunshine laws require only that there be a record of public comments and that this record can be video, audio, or written. Streaming offers a platform for these hate groups to vocalize and spread their disparaging view of teachers and the teaching profession. Streaming emboldens these speakers further to spew their hate on social media, and some of these posts that I know you have seen should disgust you and anger you. I would expect you, at minimum, to shut down all references of grooming, indoctrination, and pedophilia at every school board by cutting the mic. It's simple. Don't call them out by saying that is not allowed while allowing them to continue. Cut the mic and don't allow them to continue. In addition, other countries don't allow, or counties don't allow applause. Why do you? This is not the Toastmasters Club. I would expect you verbalize your support of our teachers at each school board meeting prior to public comment. If you want good teachers in Seminole County, then don't implicitly support these accusations about your teachers by remaining silent. This should be in the form of a bold statement emphasizing the value of the teachers you serve. You need to make it clear that teachers who actively support the LGBTQIA students are not pedophiles, and teachers who actively support our black students are not politically indoctrinating children. These are teachers who love all their school children. In fact, we would, and sadly some do, take a bullet to protect them. I would expect that you would further defend and support teachers in writing on the Seminole County Public Schools' own social media platform. You should do this repeatedly. SPS does not just have some good teachers, we have good teachers, period. Teachers who do not indoctrinate, teachers who do not groom, and teachers who are not pedophiles. Supporting teachers is not a politically partisan action. You cannot remain neutral in this. There are things you could do but have chosen not to. Why? Instead of constantly defending your own inaction, defend us. Without us, there is no public school and thus no school board. Thank you. Order, please. I'm Nina Sandberg. I am a former student, a former teacher, and a current SCPS parent. There are people behind me who have just spoken, who have lied outright about other people. They are telling lies to the board, and it is disgusting. I am absolutely disgusted by the lies. In addition, there are people who are demanding fascism, and they want to violate everybody else's rights so that they can have fascism. You can't have fascism. You can't do it. As for the bullying, I have a long history of being a parent who has complained about the bullying. In fact, I first started complaining about the bullying in August of 2017. And I was here to complain about the bullying while none of these people were here to uh, complain about the bullying. I know that the 504 plan kids and the IEP kids get bullied ruthlessly and relentlessly. I know that bullying was completely and totally out of control at both Indian Trails Middle School and Oviedo High School this year. I know that this is an equal opportunity bullying organization where anyone and everyone can get bullied and not just people in the LGBTQ community. I am extremely offended by these people who sit here and pretend like they are the only ones who ever get bullied in this school system because that is an outright lie and I can tell that on behalf of all of the special education kids that is an outright lie. It is a complete and total lie. There are specific things that the school system needs to do in order to fix the problems and we need to be adults about it and talk about them. 
first thing that you need to do is you need to give anti-bullying education. It needs to happen in August and September, and it needs to be given to everyone, including teachers, because I have seen employees who bully students, along with students who bully students, and they do it ruthlessly. My son was bullied to the point where it was child abuse by an employee who still works in this system. So I don't want to, and I'm a former teacher, I don't want to hear that teachers don't do it. They do it too. I've seen them do it. I saw them do it when I was a teacher. So let's not pretend here about it. Let's not pretend. We need anti-bullying education for everyone. You need to get that anti-bullying brochure out. You need to print it. You need to circulate it everywhere. You need to put it on your website. You took down the anti-bullying pages on my daughter's school's website. All those anti-bullying pages need to be put back. You need to have an actual program that talks about bullying, that teaches these children about bullying. And we need to stop pretending like only one single group is being bullied in this school system. That is an outright lie. James Evans, followed by Sandy Stenoff, followed by Dominique Barda. Good evening, board members. My name is James Evans. Um, I'm a, just a concerned parent out of Seminole County. Uh, at the last meeting, and I'm not picking on you, board member Krause, you just happened to say it, um, you mentioned that we're a top five premier school within our state with a uh, proficiency rate of 62% as our average. And I think given the size of our school system, that is 100% a fact that should be commended as you did commit it at the last meeting. But the umbrage that I take is the word premier. You see, with 66,000 students and 62 schools, premier has to mean something extra special. And when you look in the dictionary, premier means first in status or first in class. And I wonder if that really is what we are. So I decided to look into the Department of Education statistics. I'd like to read off a couple of results that I found from the DOE website, and I hope they're as alarming to you as they were to me. You see, Pinecrest Elementary has a 27% proficiency in English, 21% proficiency in math. Wicklow, 33% in English, 31% in math. Idlewild Elementary, 42% proficiency in English, 33% in math. Spring Lake, 45% in English, 50% in math. Hamilton, 45% in English, 49% in math. Midway, 49% proficiency, 45% in math. Lake Howell, Lyman, and Seminole High School all average around 50% English and 37% in math. You see, that's 17 schools. That is 27% of our school system that is below the state average of 55%. And if my numbers were incorrect uh, from last meeting, Board Member Krause, I do apologize, but that's just what I could recall. But at the end of the day, we're below 50%. That means half of our students aren't leaving our schools with the basic adequacy of English and math. So what's a common thread between these schools, though? Well, they're predominantly, the ones that I listed are predominantly filled with minority students and economically disadvantaged students. And as a district, I find it quite alarming that we're very quick to celebrate how some of the numbers that are absolutely wonderful, Heathrow Elementary has an 82% proficiency. That's astronomical when you look across the state. But I also find it very deeply disturbing that we would quickly press on and away from an issue that so desperately needs attention simply because it doesn't mirror the autobiography that Seminole County Public Schools has written. We cannot sit here and pat ourselves on the back for a full quarter of our students not properly being educated. The mission of the school board is for the entire student body, not the rich kids, not the Christian kids, or the majorities. It's the residents, children, that should be educated equally. So Seminole County School Board, I'm here as a concerned parent to grade you today. And today, because our, we have 27% of our schools not meeting the average, I'm deducting 27%. Out of 73%, we are hereby awarded a C minus. I hope you don't, I hope you aren't happy with that mediocrity. Thank you. Sandy Stenoff.
Sandy Stenoff. Dominique Barta. Followed by Wes Hodge, followed by Kim Finnegan. Hi, my name is Dominique Baeta. I'm the choir teacher at Lake Mary High School, at least for a few more days before heading to graduate school this fall. I've been part of the Seminole County, I have been part of Seminole County Schools for 16 years, first as a student and as a teacher for the last three. I've been part of the Seminole County Public Schools family for a very long time. I spoke at the last meeting and would like to restate my hope that you will approve the proclamation to support LGBTQ plus students, families, and staff. This proclamation is simply a statement of support. It requires no additional funding or events, just some courage on your part. It's the starting point to making this underrepresented population feel safe in our schools. In the Trevor Project study mentioned several times, rates of suicide decreased drastically when a student lived in a community that the student considered supportive of LGBTQ plus communities. That is what this proclamation would do. You have heard from students, parents, teachers of all different schools and backgrounds. People with strong ties and love for our county. We are Seminole County Public Schools. I know you know this is important or else you wouldn't hesitate to make this proclamation. This Pride Month, choose to do your own research on LGBTQ plus issues. Choose to ask yourself the hard questions and choose to be on the side of love and support. Happy Pride Month, Seminole County. Thank you. Wes Hodge. Good evening. Uh, my name is Wes Hodge. I'm the chair of the Orange County Democratic Party. Traveled 12 miles to get here today, but it feels like I've gone back in time about 40 years. I cannot believe that I'm standing here before you upset about the inaction you took just a few weeks ago. I wasn't going to say anything, but silence is what bullies want. They want gay people like me to be quiet, to just go away. I've been indoctrinated since I was a child, forced to read books about moms and dads, forced to read about you know, heterosexual relationships, read the Bible, and guess what? I ended up gay, because that's who I am. It's not gonna change because of a proclamation. It's not gonna change because of a book. But you know what it does help? Is when adults reach out and support children, children like me, who were bullied and beaten. I assure you, bullying is not pie. There's plenty of it to go around. We're not here to talk about bullying only happens to gay kids, because guess what? It happens to everybody. It happens to girls, it happens to boys, it happens to non-binary kids. It happens to black kids, it happens to Hispanic kids. Someone doesn't speak perfect English, someone's too short, someone's too tall. But you know what, when we come together and say, we embrace your differences, we embrace you as part of our community, that's a good thing. Because they feel welcome, they feel loved, they feel appreciated. This is not to put others aside, it's to embrace people that are really having a really crappy time with their life. So I really hope that you'll reconsider this action. Because in February, when it comes time for Black History Month, can you make that same proclam pull that proclamation and just be okay with that? Because I sure as hell wouldn't be that way. So please reconsider that. You have another chance in October with come out, uh, come out, National Coming Out Day is October 11th. You can do a proclamation in support of that and support your LGBTQ plus community. Also, I would like to acknowledge one of our LGBTQ plus represented, uh, elected officials, Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith. I'm certain that he would love to address you all on this topic, and I hope that you will give him the opportunity to do so, because he, like I, are proud members of our LGBTQ plus community, and we support all of our kids here today. Thank you. Order, please. Order. Kim, Finne Kim Finnegan. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. 
My name is Kim Finnegan. I um, teach at Oviedo High School. I'm a Oviedo resident, and all four of my kids are either in or have gone through uh, Seminole County Public Schools. I do want to start with a little bit of disappointment over the lack of action everybody else has discussed tonight about um, acknowledging Pride Month. This was something that began last year. I was here at the meeting where, um, after um, Representative Krause brought it up, and we advocated for it. It was supposed to be discussed. There was going to be a committee. Um, my daughter was in one of the videos that the county supposedly put together interviewing kids about their experiences in schools. Never saw the video. I don't know if you guys did. No one's answered. Um, so it's been a year of hemming and hawing, and still, we're back where we were. But tonight, I'm looking forward. So as we go into the next school year, and I know it's the first day of summer, but we teachers, we got a month and a half left before we have to go back. Um, I think there's an understanding that I believe the board, as well as anyone who comes up here to speak on some of these issues, um, needs to keep in mind. Some of the most hotly debated topics over the course of last year affecting our children in Seminole County Public Schools have been punted around like a political football. Mental health uh, initiatives and clear, informed, consistent support of our marginalized students, including uh, black, indigenous people of color and LGBTQ students have been turned into political and religious issues, but in actuality, they are not. They are not religious issues for this school system at large because SCPS is a secular school system, not a religious one. Everyone, parent, child, is entitled to follow what their own religion dictates and all religions should feel welcome in our schools, but no one religion should dominate the public school system or how it is run. These hot button issues are not political either, even though they've been made out to be as they have been discussed, argued, and distorted in many of these meetings. So what are they? They are human rights issues. The mental health of all our children at SCPS is not a political issue. Social emotional learning is simply teaching kids how to deal with their emotions in a constructive and healthy way. All students. It's helping kids from broken homes, kids who are being bullied, kids who are bullies, kids who are dealing with issues and pressures none of us may even be aware of. Recognizing and acknowledging and supporting our marginalized communities is not political. They're human beings. This recognition is so vital so that every student feels just as seen and as supported as the majority population in our schools. Learning cannot begin until a student feels safe and seen. Nurturing and preparing our students is not political. It's what every student has a right to. So I ask you as a board to remember who it is your responsibility to serve. It is the children that you're serving, not the opinions of specific groups, political, religious, whatever. Those should not be the ones that sway you. It should be what educational research and understanding of children tells you to do to support our kids. And on that note, I feel it's important to let you know that as an Obito resident, SCPS parent, and SCPS teacher, that those groups that employ scare tactics, half-truths, and fear at so many of these meetings do not speak for me. Thank you. Order, please. That concludes public comment. Uh, Superintendent, do you have a recommendation on the consent agenda? Yes, that the consent agenda be approved as presented. I have a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any, aye. Any, any discussion? Any opposed? Order. Motion carries. Okay, so we got this, we got the consent agenda on the record. Okay, thank you. Superintendent, do you have a recommendation on student discipline hearings? Yes, that the School Board of Seminole County approve the student disciplinary recommendations from May 31, 2022. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? All no. in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say aye. Motion carries. Superintendent, you have a recommendation for new business. Yes, that the School Board of Seminole County approve the recommendation of the Insurance Committee and authorize the Employee Benefits and Wellness Department to move forward with renewing the dental insurance plan and bring the final policies and agreements back for final approval. Dr. Calderon, do you have a statement? 
Yes, Madam Chair. Pursuant to Florida statute section 112.3143, and to avoid even the appearance of a conflict, I am abstaining from this vote as it may result in a special gain or loss for my relative. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Point of order. Wait, I need a second. Yes, I please. Apologize. Thank you, Chairman. Christine. Oh, second. Uh, that would Thank be. you. Um, any discussion? Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Superintendent, do you have a report? It is read only and included in the agenda book. And uh, board member, board committee updates. Um, member Krause. Sorry, um, we talked, uh, I had a, a children's cabinet meeting that um, attorney Carlene Co. Palmer went to. Um, I was not able to attend. Um, and I feel compelled to ask my fellow board members if they would agree to have a social media posting that says Happy Pride Month. So I'm asking you. Would you allow our communications department to make a social media post, not a proclamation, not a policy-based item? Point but, of but order. Just an affirmation. Point of order, um, Madam Chair, if Member Krause would like to um, have the board make a consideration, it has to be in the form of a motion. Okay, I would like to make a motion, although highly un unusual because we don't make motions to have social mo media posts approved. But I would like to make a motion that my board consider a social media post recognizing June as Pride Month for two thousand June of two thousand twenty-two. So I will dis I will second for discussion. Okay, and um, discussion. May I speak? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time in my twelve years that I've ever been asked to have any kind of influence or approval or consideration for a post on our social media. Um, I think it's an administrative function with the administrative team. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Superintendent. That is correct as far as the, the district's um, postings and so forth is, is typically run by the, the district administrative team. That is correct. And do you give them direction? I do. Can you share that direction with us, please? Well, the, there has not been any direction um, specific to this, to, to or this to any topic. Posting. Well, the generally, uh, Mr. I haven't given them um, specific direction regarding postings or not about Pride Month. I guess if that's the the question. Um, and any other posting that they do, do they come to you or they just do it? No as part of the general um, kind of review of the communications messaging. Okay. Um, if there is a particular um, request, then, then that would be made to, to Mr. Lawrence, but has there, is that um, part of um, my general direction to him? It has not needed to be. Okay. Um, I think a lesson that we learned the hard way was to ever no, don't don't take this wrong. To ever vote on anything that had not been put out there um, on the agenda prior to, I would say an exception could be an emergency. Could, may not, but could. Um, I'm uncomfortable making the decision without the public having known. We talk about transparency all the time. Had we had an opportunity to discuss it at work session. Um, would have been different prior to, because public would have had an opportunity. I'm not for or against the topic being put out there. That's not where I'm coming from. I hope it's clear. Member Krauss, would you like to add any more comments? I um, simply will just add that I think it um, clearly we have approximately 3,500 students that do identify as LGBTQ um, plus, as well as employees and staff members. And it is a small, very small token of affirmation for them. And that's the reason that I brought it up today. We have eight days left in June, nine days left in June. And um, 
would, would like to ask for consideration and empathy for, um, for the cause. That's all. And if you're ready to call the vote, I'm fine. Dr. Calderon, do you have any comments to add? Well, I think my record shows that I support all students at all times. And while I respect and honor you, Mrs. Krause, for your motion, my concern is the overarching school board um, job of setting policy. And in my 12 years on this board, I have never directed staff to do a social media post. And I feel that once we start micromanaging, which we by law cannot do, it could um, hurt us. I feel actions speak louder than words and our actions by policy, which we do control, have said we support all in both employees and students. And I will continue to do that every single day. I honor and respect all. And um, I, I really feel that we need to support all of our people and I'm co concerned from a school board standpoint going into an area, as Mrs. Allman said, to bring something up without public notice of transparency before it. Thank you. And I also agree our, our policies are inclusive of all students and all staff. Um, I, I am concerned that over and over again, we have people uh, making accusations that we don't support our students, we don't support our staff. And I think that uh, requires us to take a deeper dive into those core situations and issues and address them. I, I myself don't feel that social media post addresses that, fixes that. I understand the intent, but I think in order for us to make sure we are inclusive, we are um, solving the concerns that get brought to us every single board meeting over um, LGBTQAI plus students, faculty that we um, address the core issues. I think it's overreaching for us to, um, like Dr. Um, Calderon said, to direct the superintendent on something we've delegated her to do, her job. Um, it is up to her how she manages this organization and how she does that job. So uh, that is my, my opinion. And uh, we can call the vote. Um, in, unless there's any further discussion. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. All of, any, any last call for any more discussion? All opposed say aye. 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 Motion fails. Okay. Um, and Member Cross, any other? No, the rest of my okay. meetings are next okay. next week. Dr. Calderon, did you have a board committee update? I believe, isn't it mine? After Sorry. Mr. Krauss? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't have any committee reports because there has been no activity, um, but I would like a point of clarification for the record. I heard multiple persons out there say that with no, no discussion, the proclamation was pulled from the agenda and from the school board meeting point of view, that would be correct at that meeting. But prior to that afternoon, we had a work session. I asked actually that the topic of a proclamation be put on the agenda, which it was. We all had an opportunity to speak in support of or not whatever we chose to do. When things go to the work session for discussion, if it's evident that there is not enough support for an item, it does not go to the agenda. And that is what happened. Please correct me if I'm not correct, Superintendent. That is correct in that um, after the discussion, um, specifically there was a request that um, rulemaking regarding proclamations occur before um, the, the topic of the proclamation um, be placed on the agenda for voting. And so the request after that discussion was withdrawn. 
at Thank the you. board meeting. So next step would be rulemaking in regards to proclamations, which is um, scheduled, I think, believe, for July. July Thank you. 26th. And that would be right. general proclamation, Correct. not specific. Thank you. That concludes my comments. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Calderon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to give everybody an update. Um, we've been in very deep conversations of very he heavy topics today, but um, on a lighter note, serving on the Orlando Science Center board, I have good news to report that um, the Science Center is doing very well. They've had a 35% increase in walk-in um, participants in pre-pandemic. Uh, their grants since our last meeting has increased over $750,000. And just to mark all of your calendars that the Inspire Science Breakfast will be held on Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. Additionally, I just wanted to thank my fellow board members and superintendent for a very successful FSBA conference and garnered a lot of good information that I am still uh, distributing to our staff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I don't have, I haven't had any committee meetings. My um, audit committee is this coming Thursday. So I have no other further uh, information to share, but I do want to extend a very happy birthday to member Krauss today. I hope that you had a wonderful day. Go ahead, get to go home and have a wonderful evening with your family. Thank you very much. And this meeting happy is adjourned. Happy birthday. And this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>